الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد In the beautiful example of the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we're at the stage where now the da'wah is beginning yani Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is now calling people to what has been revealed to him right and this is a very early stage now the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam you have stages right so you have qabl al nabuwa before prophethood right 40 years before. After the prophethood of the Prophet ﷺ, we have a few stages, right? One of the stages is where the da'wah is secret. Why? Because the people and the masses had become so corrupt that if you brought the message, you would immediately be attacked, right? And this, this happens, yeah, you see through society sometimes, where corruption becomes so widespread that when you speak the truth or you say what is right, people automatically attack you. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, if you look in uh, like the communist countries, right? There was a time where in Russia and countries like this, if you said, hey, people should have the freedom to choose whatever kind of shoes they want to buy, you would be arrested, you know? Why? Because they would have one system, which everybody gets the same shoes, the government, you know, so on. Except for the elite who would go and buy whatever from other countries, right? So, it's not that the message is something secret, but it is because of the corruption in the land. So this began a period, which is the secret da'wah. This is in Mecca. Then, in Mecca, you will have the period that is the open da'wah. Meaning when there were enough companions and Allah had blessed the Muslims having enough, that now they would openly call towards Allah. And that's a very difficult time. This first stage is easier. Why? Because even if you believe in the truth and practice it to your own worship, people don't usually care. But when you start calling towards what is right, when you start telling people what, you, what they're doing, the wrongs that they're doing are wrong, then you will see the hardships come. You know, if you just do your own thing, like you just, whatever you may believe in things, everybody will be fine with it. Right? If you let the murderers murder, and if you let the banks uh, loot people with, with riba, with interest, and you let society uh, misuse people as they do, and make women into objects of uh, selling things, and you just don't say anything. You just go and you pray, nobody's going to care. Right? But when you start telling people, look, this is wrong. You, you take a woman and, and you degrade her, where now people are only worried about her measurements and only worried about how perfect she fits a particular uh, set of values or model or, or measurement that you have made. And this is wrong. Now people will start attacking you. When you start telling people riba is wrong, charging this kind of usury and interest and enslaving people to these kinds of banks, this is wrong. Now people are going to give you labels. Right? Otherwise, you'll be invited to give khutbah and fundraising in every masjid. But when you start talking about Qur'an and Sunnah, when you start saying what's bid'ah, when you start saying what's haram, this is when you're going to see who's going to... You're going to find out who's on the truth then. Right? You're going to find out who will stand with you then. Right? So the second phase of da'wah is very difficult. This is the open da'wah. The third phase, which will happen yani, around... Uh, 10 years after the Nabuwa, after the prophethood, is when the da'wah goes outside of Mecca, where the Prophet ﷺ starts sending the Sahaba and at times himself, he goes outside of Mecca to start calling people outside of the city of Mecca towards Islam. And the third stage, uh, it, it goes on until about the 13th year of Hijri uh, of, of Nabuwa, 13 years after the Nabuwa, after the prophethood to the Hijri calendar, the beginning of the Hijri calendar, 13th year after the Prophet, when the Prophet made Hijrah from Mecca to Medina. And that begins a fourth stage, where now the da'wah will be safe and, and, and you will be going forward all over the world, sending yani, the, the Sahaba to different areas, 
sending uh, letters all the way to the Persian and Roman and, and the king of Bahrain and so on. So these are the stages. The stage we are discussing now is the first stage of da'wah. The da'wah is still secret. The Prophet Muhammad has had the revelation where Jibreel والسلام, has brought the beginning ayat of Surah Alaq onwards to the Prophet وسلم, in, in the ghar, in the, in the cave, right? And now the beginning message begins. Who is the first one to accept this message? Khatija radiallahu anha. Subhanallah, yani the, the wife of the Prophet وسلم, the first Muslimah in the acceptance of Islam upon the hands of the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now this is interesting. When we say the first Muslim, it doesn't mean that there was never a Muslim before. <laughs> Obviously, Maryam alayhi salam and other women that were believers were believers. But the first Muslim, yani in the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And I'm making this clarification because sometimes when you find in the Quran where Ibrahim alayhi salam says, I'm the first of the Muslims, or the Prophet said, will be the first of the Muslims. People say, oh, it's a contradiction. Like, no, it's not a contradiction. Of course, these are the different nations. Even today, if I was to tell you guys, hey, we're going to do a fundraising and we need to raise some money for a, for a brother who's in need. And Brother Mish'al says, I'm the first to donate. It doesn't mean that nobody's ever donated before. Right? First, in line to this situation. From the men, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, he accepts Islam. And we spoke about the fadal of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And from him, from his first day, from his first responsibility, he goes out and starts giving da'wah to what he knows. And Uthman ibn Affan, Dhul Nurayn, the great Sahabi, Zubair ibn Awam, who's also the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu Talha, the great Sahabi, who's called the living Shaheed. We'll talk about him in the later durus, inshallah. Sa'ad ibn Waqas, also the uncle of the Prophet sallallahu through the marital side. Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah, Abdurrahman bin Auf, these great Sahaba, they accept Islam. All of these six are also from the people who were given the glad tidings of Jannah in the same hadith. And what a great benefit Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu does immediately after accepting Islam. He gives da'wah to what he knows. He goes and tells people that Muhammad والسلام, is the messenger of Allah. And there is none worthy worship except on Allah. When they have questions, he doesn't just make up the answer. He then takes them back to the Prophet And these people accept Islam. Including in that first wave of da'wah from Abu Bakr radiyanhu, you have Uthman ibn Mal'um and his brother uh, Qudama and Abdullah and Abu Salama ibn Asad uh, and others. Yani who he gives da'wah to. Fatima radiyallahu anha. Uh, the, and this we're talking about the sister of Umar uh, ibn Khattab. She also accepts Islam with her husband, Sa'id ibn Zayd. Who her husband is also one of the ten given the glad tidings of Jannah. Bilal, Ubaidah, Ibn al Harith, uh, Khabbab, and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, early people to accept Islam. Now, Bilal, radiallahu anhu, he's a slave at this time to the mushrikeen, to the polytheists. And the Prophet والسلام, encourages the Sahaba to free him, to buy his freedom. And we'll talk about Abu Bakr radiallahu how he. Uh, but the freedom of Bilal radiallahu anhu. But what does this tell you? The Prophet والسلام, now is encouraging the end of slavery. Slavery was there in the Arabian Peninsula before Islam. <coughs> before Islam, they had slavery. And we'll talk about uh, Zayd ibn Haratha radiallahu anhu and Osama ibn Zayd and so on today as well, inshallah. But one of the first things the Prophet وسلم, does is he starts to encourage the Sahaba, the companions, to free slaves, even those that are enslaved to the polities, to the mushrikeen. And these people become, these early Muslims become the leaders of the Muslim community. It doesn't matter that they're black or white, Arab or Ajam, didn't matter. Bilal Radiyanu was a slave. He was an African. And he was enslaved by the polities before Islam. Abu Bakr Radiyan frees him, doesn't ask anything of him, doesn't say pay me back, nothing, frees him. He ends up being the Amir. He was appointed as the leader, the governor of Sham. Sham were the whitest people in the Muslim Ummah at the time, lightest skin. And it was the richest region in the Muslim Ummah. It was the best in trade. Nobody said, why is there a black man leading? 
لا, because Islam did away with all of this racism. Nobody is better in front of Allah, not the black to the white, or white over black, or, or red, or this or that, skin color, rich, poor, except with taqwa. Whoever is more pious, whoever is more capable, he is put ahead. That's something beautiful about Islam. People miss. Now, the Prophet وسلم, he begins his da'wah. There are what we do in these gurus is we rely upon authentic narrations. Like what is Sahih or Hassan at minimum, Maqbul. There are narrations that mention Khatija Radiana at this time. She calls the Prophet وسلم, to her to يعني, enjoy relations and he tells her the days of rest are gone and no more sleep. These are all weak narrations. In fact, most of these I couldn't find in any book of hadith. I found it in Fidral al Quran in a book of tafsir. But what is apparent, and this is a made up narration, right? We want to stay away from these. A lot of people, they quote these, even though they're not authentic. In fact, some of them have no chain at all. Right? So we have to be careful. It's not just about making your dars sound good. It's not about just, okay, it's seerah, who cares? No. We take our aqidah, our fiqh, our manhaj from the seerah. So you want to rely upon that, which is authentic and checked. Abu Bakr radiyanhu, now he's giving da'wah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he is calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala secretly. When you give da'wah, there is a responsibility. It's a huge responsibility. Because now, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he is by himself with few companions, few people around him, the ones we mentioned. And the responsibility he has is for all of mankind. I think about that. Like people stress out about things, think about that stress. You are responsible for all of mankind till the day of judgment. And everybody around you is against you. Except for that handful of the beautiful Sahaba. This is why we love the Sahaba. These were the people who and he stood up for that haqq, Abu Bakr and Uthman, and we'll talk about Ali and others. Radiallahu anhum. Here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he starts to call people secretly. One of the people that was in the household of the Prophet ﷺ was the great companion Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He was the son of Abu Talib. Abu Talib was the uncle of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So why was he being raised in the house of Rasulullah ﷺ? Because as we mentioned earlier, Abu Talib had a lot of children. And he used to spend a lot of his money trying to help the poor and the travelers and those that came for pilgrimage before Islam. So he was in financial hardship. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, when he married Khadija radiallahu anha, and they had a successful business, out of a good repayment of the fact that Abu Talib had raised the Prophet ﷺ for a period of his life. He wanted to make easy the hardship on Abu Talib. So he told him and he told others to take some children of Abu Talib and raise them. Take care of that raising financially, feeding, doing all of that. And the son of Abu Talib that came to the house of the Prophet ﷺ by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. So Ali Radian, who since childhood he was raised in the household of the Prophet. One time, as Ibn Kathir had mentioned in Bidaya and Nihaya, originally quoting from Ibn Ishaq, Ali radiallahu anhu, he comes and he finds the Prophet and Khatija radiallahu anha, them praying. Khatija radiallahu anha and Rasulullah are praying. Now, this prayer is at the beginning of Islam. This is not the regular five salawat yet. But two salawat were obligated in the beginning. And the other were nawafil. And the fasting of yani, in Muharram was obligated. Ramadan was not ob- So this is everything in stages. So at this stage they are praying because it's the beginning stage. But this prayer is not like the, t- like, like the earlier times, right? Now Allah has told the Prophet ﷺ how to pray. So when he sees this difference, he says, Ya Muhammad ﷺ, ma hada? Like what is this? He asked the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ now gives him da'wah. 
He calls him towards Islam. He's saying, this is deen Allah. This is the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alladhi istafa, the one that I have been chosen, linnafsi, right, for myself and sent out to mankind. Rasulan, yani, as a messenger. And I call you towards Allah wahdahu la sharika la. Towards one Allah and no partner. Tayyid, now what is the uh, benefit we need to learn from this, right? What is the first thing to call towards? Tawheed. Today people, they say we give da'wah. And what do they do? They say we're going to make a hijab day. We're going to make a fasting day. We're going to make, uh, uh, I don't know, have a beard day. I don't know like what new days are coming up, right? And then somebody's upon shirk and upon shirk and shirk. And instead of calling them towards Tawheed, we call them, oh, why don't you fast? It's really good for you. It cleanses you out. No doubt, fasting is a great thing and it does cleanse you out. But we don't fast because the health benefits, that's a side benefit that we get from it. We fast because Allah ordained it. Right? People want to go and approve of people's shirk. Somebody's making shirk and you're like, yes, Merry Christmas to you too. Happy Hanukkah. Yes, I'm giving them da'wah this way. <laughs> It's not the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa You see somebody worshipping a grave and making shirk and you tell them, no, no, don't worry about that, just come to the masjid. No, the first thing you have to call towards is tawheed. And this is why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that is the, this is the da'wah of Rasulullah. This is the, the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He called him towards the da'wah. And he said, I'll call you towards uh, Allah wahdahu la sharika la. And to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Subhanallah Not just that you worship Allah Understand what I'm saying This is important This is the beginning of da'wah They have no statehood They have no khilafah They have no support That was secret But Rasulullah doesn't tell him Yes, believe in Allah And then Believe in whatever else you want. No. He tells them, I call you to believe in Allah and make kufr and deny and, you know, disbelieve in idols. Islam can never accept shirk. Today people, they, they want to mix the religion. Somebody's making shirk, somebody's worshipping Ali radiyallahu, somebody's worshipping grave and you want to tell them it's okay. They believe in Allah. They say the word Allah. No, you have to make kufr of the idols. You have to disbelieve in all other things. Only Allah can be worshipped. No sahabi, no saint, no prophet is worshipped. Only Allah is worshipped. Here Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells him this. Now Ali radiallahu anhu, he was a very intelligent young man. He was very young at this time. He said, هذا أمر لم أسمع به قبل. He said, this is something I've never heard before. So I'm going to go speak to my father Abu Talib. Abu Talib was very intelligent. Abu Talib was a leader in the Quraysh. He was a chief. He was somebody that obviously Ali Radiyan looked up to, was his father. He said, I'm going to go speak to my father. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi told him, Ida lam tuslim. If you do not become Muslim, at least conceal this amr this with you. Keep the secret with you. Why? Because the da'wah is still secret. We're not ready at the stage where we're going to take it to everybody. Now this is from the virtues of Ali Radiyanu that he was raised in the house of the Prophet He got the da'wah at the, uh, on the lisan, on the tongue of the Prophet He gave him da'wah himself. But subhanAllah, look at Abu Bakr Radiyanu. When the da'wah was given to him, he didn't think twice. As soon as he heard it, he accepted. That's what the Prophet said, that everybody thought about it except Abu Bakr. Ali Radiyan now, he went home at this time. Yani he was already out of the house, but he was in and out with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he thought about this. Yani he contemplated all night about this. And he thought, you know, this is such a beautiful thing to believe in one Allah. What can the idols do? And he saw it in his fitrah, in his own self. So the next day he came and he accepted Islam. And he started to give da'wah to his brothers. From the well-known children of Abu Talib, we have Ja'far. Ja'far radiallahu anhu, he also became Muslim. After Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Talib, the one that he's called Abu Talib from, died without Islam. 
before Islam or hearing or not, but he died not in the state of being Muslim. But Ja'far and Ali, the children of Abu Talib, both of them, radiallahu anhuma, both of them become Muslim. Ali radiallahu, because we're at the stage of his Islam, I wanted to speak a little bit about him. He grew up in the house of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and already explained why. Imam al-Bukhari has in his Sahih, in his authentic collection, the call, call of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qala al-Nabi alayhi wa sallam, li Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu. He tells to Ali radiyanhu, anta minni wa anna minka. Subhanallah, you are from me and I am from you. And what a beautiful statement. For us, the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we love Ali ibn Abi Talib. You look at the, the love we have. How can we uh, not have that extreme love for somebody that the Prophet ﷺ said to him, you are from me and I am from you. Like he did to Julaibib radiallahu anhu. But what we do is we're just. We love Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu but we also love Abu Bakr radiallahu We also love Uthman radiallahu We also love Umar radiallahu We love Hassan Hussein radiallahu anhu. We love all of the Sahaba. Those that Allah loved, how can we not love? Those that Allah is pleased with, how can we not be pleased with? Others, they have this ta'assum, this partisanship. When the Hadith of Bukhari mentions the virtue of one companion, they take it. And when the same Bukhari mentions the virtue of another companion according to the same stringent criteria, they reject it. Not us. If it's authentically established on the Prophet ﷺ, we always accept it. And if it's weak, whether it benefits us or not, we reject it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu as Umar ibn Khattab. He says that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam died wa huwa anhu, yani an Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu radin. What does Umar ibn Khattab? Now look at the love the Sahaba had for each other. Leave the lies and fabrication. Look at the Sahih narration. Umar ibn Khattab is saying that Rasulullah Muhammad alayhi wa sallam loved Ali radiyan and died in a state of being pleased with Ali Radiyan. If you look at the Ahadith, and these are all in Bukhari, I'm going to summarize between them, but if you want to look that up in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, Hadith number 3701, 702, and 703. Meaning, 3701, 3702, and 3703, they all mention this. During the Battle of Khaybar, Ali Radiyan, who he had, a, a uh, issue with his eyes. And Ali Radiyan hated to be left behind. He loved to be alongside the Prophet in the harshest of battles. And he, today, from the weakness of our Iman, when there is a pleasurable moment, we are with our shiruk and our uh, imma and our ulema. Right? I mean, imagine if you have uh, yani a sheikh, yani a sheikh somewhere like a scholar, and he gets invited to uh, uh, some king's house uh, as an invitation. And he says, all your students that want to come, the king's going to pay for the tickets. And he's going to pay for the staying. And we'll have big ulema. And we'll have um, halal. I mean, all good. Right? Everybody's ready to go. You're going to be on national TV and all of that. Everybody's ready to go. And then you find out that a particular day, uh, you're going to get attacked. And there's going to be 300 people coming with bats. <laughs> Some brothers will be there, mashallah. There's a lot of excuses that will start popping up. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, that, I was going to be there. But my car, I had a flat tire. And then I was trying to fix it. And then my jack broke. And then I broke a nail. You know, and it really hurt. <laughs> Ali bin Abi Talib radiyallahu, subhanallah, he loved to be in the heat of the battle. He hated to ever be left behind. And we'll talk about this a little bit. Ali radiyallahu, he didn't want to stay back. He had a problem in the eyes. He couldn't see. But he said, how can it be that the Prophet is going to a battle and I'm left behind? No way. Okay. Now he's under this distress. And Rasulullah sallallahu says that I will give the flag for the Muslim army, the flag, to somebody who Allah will give us victory to him. And somebody who loves Allah and he loves his messenger, alayhi salatu we have no doubt to the love of Ali radiyallahu to Allah or his messenger because the Prophet ﷺ told us. And in some narration even says, and Allah and his messenger love him. This is the status of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu. 
And then Rasulullah sallallahu took that flag to who? Everybody wanted it. He took it to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he took his blessed saliva and he put it in the eyes from the saliva of Rasulullah sallallahu has shifa. It has cure. It not only instantly, miraculously, and this is mentioned through many chains that are in Bukhari and Muslim, authentic chains. This is another authentically established miracle of the Prophet sallallahu It cured the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu. But Ali radiyallahu says, for the rest of my life, I never had any eye issues. Never had any problem. Even when any people's eyesight starts to weaken, he says his eyesight will be very sharp. He said, why? Because the best saliva of the Prophet was in my eyes. Ali bin Abi Talib radiyallahu. Now, and then, you know, Rasulullah gave him a sword and so on. I mean, many virtues, but I'm going to summarize. I'll mention something that's kind of funny. Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, the great Sahabi, once somebody came to him and said, you know the person on the member, he is cursing the Ali radiallahu anhu. He said, how could anybody curse Ali radiallahu anhu on the member? How could that be? Eh? He says, what is he saying? He's saying he's calling Ali radiallahu anhu Abu Turab, the father of dust. Eh? Sahal ibn Sa'ad radiallahu anhu smiled. He told him, no, no, that's not a curse. That's his kunya. So there is two ways to get a kunya. Yani one is that it is your son or your sometimes your daughter, depending, or your eldest son, or depends, right? which is the regular way. For example, uh, Abu Hafs, Umar radiyanhu, from his daughter Hafsa, not from his son. Right? Some, uh, for example, Uthman radiyanhu is Abu Abdullah. He has a son named Abdullah. Right? But sometimes a kunya is given because of your sifat, or because of some characteristics, or because of some incident in your life. Right? For example, Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, he doesn't have a daughter named Huraira. This is because, as some of the ulama of tarikh have said, that he had cats and so on. So they call him the father of kin. Right? Abu Bakr. Bakr is not the name of his son. Right? Bakr is the young, strong camel. So because of his strong nature, because of his strong inside, even though physically he was very skinny, Abu Bakr of Yamin. But from the heart, he was very strong. So he was called Abu Bakr. Right? Now Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has Qasim, so his kunya is Abu Qasim. Right? But we look at other Sahaba, you will find the kunya many times on characteristics. How did Ali Rabian get the kunya of Abu Turab? One time, and he, as marriages happen, you know, when you get married, uh, you're going to have some clashes sometimes. And he did every marriage. Right? At one time, he was upset with Fatima Radiyanha for whatever reason, and he went to the masjid and he just laid down. And as he laid, at the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they didn't have carpet in the masjid, even the roof was just, you know, palm tree leaves and so on, dust would be there in Medina. So dust came and there was dust on him. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's his daughter. And that's his daughter, but look at what a wonderful father-in-law he was. He didn't just go, okay, it's my daughter, so she's got to be right for everything. No, how dare you say anything to my daughter? No, he went to the masjid and he saw Ali Radiyan and out of love for him, he started to take that dust off. And he said, yeah, Abu Tarab. Oh, father of dust. And, and this kunya stuck with him. So this is, this is a closeness that they had, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. In the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, Hadith number 3706. This is all under the Bab of Allah al-Sahab, under the Bab of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanhu. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told Ali radiyanhu, Ama tarda, aren't you happy an takuna minni, and that you are from me, bi manzilat Harun min Musa. Aren't you pleased that you are with me in relations to me at the start of how Harun was with Musa alayhi salam. Hadith Sahih in Al-Bukhari. Right? Now, the interesting thing, right? Many of the Rafida, the people with the corruption in their hearts and minds and lack of intelligence, right? They will take this hadith and say, oh, look, in your book, Bukhari, not our book, not Bukhari wrote this for us, the whole Ummah, you guys use it, right? In, the, in your Sahih Al-Bukhari, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told, Ali ibn Abi Talib, that you are to me like Harun to Musa. So that means that Ali radiyan should have been the first Ali. Tell you. First stupidity of that claim. Who died first? Musa or Harun? Harun. Who? Harun. Harun alayhi salam. <laughs> so Harun alayhi salam did not 
succeed Musa as the leader of the, of the Muslim Ummah of the time and Ibn Israel. This is the first foolishness. Secondly, what is the context of this? This is at the time when Rasulullah was leaving and he left Ali ibn Abi Talib to be in charge of protecting the Muslims. So as I mentioned earlier, Ali Radhan never wanted to stay behind. So here Ali Radhan was upset that Rasulullah son is going out for qital, for jihad, fi sabillah, not being left behind. So Rasulullah sallallahu out of love for him said, Don't you, aren't you happy that you are to me like Harun was to Musa? Because when Musa sallam, left, who did he leave in charge? Harun alayhi So when you put things in context, everything is clear. But when you want to blind yourself, then khalas, how can somebody see when you want to blind themselves? So this is the beautiful relationship of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I will mention one thing here, just to be clear. Like I said, we as Muslims, we as the Ahl Sunnah, we as the people of the Jama'ah, we believe in adl, justice, in being fair and just. We mention these ahadith and these virtues of Ali radiyallahu and we have no doubt to them. We love Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu We believe he was Amir al-Mu'mineen, the fourth Khalifa from the Khalifa al-Rashidin al mahdiin We believe he's from the people of Jannah. We know his fadail. We mention his fadail. We document him. But everything we do with adl, with justice. In the same Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, in the same book, according to the same criteria of acceptance, Hadith number 3659, in the Sahih of Imam Muslim, hadith number 2386. Now, your prints may vary, but you can look it up in the Bab of the Fadal of Abu Bakr. A woman came and she asked the Prophet ﷺ that if I come and I do not find you, meaning that you have passed away from this, this dunya, who should I go to? Who will be the leader of the Sunnah? Who should I go to? Rasulullah ﷺ in the Sahih of Bukhari and Muslim, he said, if you do not find me, go to Abu Bakr. So if you're going to be just and use a hadith according to a certain criteria, then you have to be just and accept the other hadith according to the same criteria, the same books. From the early people to accept Islam, and this is the, I mean, this is the cream of the crop, this is the Sahaba, this is the, 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 the Sabiqun, the one who were Sabaq, I mean, the ones who were the first to jump towards guidance and laid the foundation, is Zayd ibn al-Haritha. Zayd ibn al-Haritha radiallahu anhu. Zayd radiallahu anhu, this is the ignorance we have to deal with some people, right? Somebody who has a, a great love for hammers came and talked about the slaves. He said, oh, Muhammad owns slaves, I told him, okay. Shows who did the Prophet sallallahu have? Who? He said, in the provisions, which is Zahd al mahal he doesn't even know the actual book. You know, it says that this and this and this. But he doesn't realize how that got to be. Right? So one of the ones that people mention is Zayd ibn Haritha. And this is a very important thing. But the ignorance of these people is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu never enslaved anybody. In what we consider as slavery, and what the Arab did as slavery, the Prophet never enslaved anyone. The only thing we have in Sharia is captives of war. Yes, obviously if somebody is trying to kill you, and you get the upper, upper hand on them, you take them as captives as armies do today. And we have our own rules and regulations of that, and we are proud of them and we love them. Everything in the Sharia we love. But slavery as a Western concept, Alhamdulillah, Islam has never had, and has always forbidden when you take free people and you kidnap them and you attack and just uh, snatch them up and you enslave them. And this is something that the West has done and in certain ways continues to do. Whether it's sex slavery or whether it's uh, South Americans that are brought and South, South, uh, yeah, South Americans brought and enslaved and sometimes Congress people have them as uh, maids, unpaid maids that can't leave. And these things come out in the news. Right? But Alhamdulillah, in Islam, this is forbidden. If any Muslims did it, it's up to them. But Islam, this is forbidden. How did Zayd ibn Haritha radiyanhu become a slave? Nothing to do with Islam. Before Islam, he and his mother were visiting or were part of a, of a tribe called Banu Kalab. Banu Kalab, it's a famous Arab tribe. 
And when they were there, the Arab polytheists, not Muslims, polytheists before Islam, they attacked the caravan and they dhulman, yani, you know, oppression, something that Islam forbids. They enslaved the people, they took everybody as hostages. And they sold Zayd ibn al Haritha, who was an Arab ethnically, he's not, uh, like, slavery was not racial even amongst the Arab. The only people that really made slavery racial were the Westerns, yani people from Europe and America. So they took him as a slave and they sold him. This is all before Islam. He ended up being sold from one master to the other by the polytheists, by the mushrikeen, until he ended up in the house of Khadija radiallahu anha. Khadija radiallahu anha, she had uh, yani purchased him or was given to her before her marriage to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa married Khadija radiallahu anha, she gave him as a gift to her. Yani this is her husband now. What did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa do? He freed him. What did he do? He freed him. He didn't enslave Zayd ibn Harith. He freed Zayd ibn Harith radiallahu anha. So Mr. Hammer, next time, might want to do your homework. Read up a couple of books before you come out. Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was in the household of Rasulullah sallallahu because he was a freed slave of Mawla. And when he, before Islam, I'm not even getting to prophethood yet. When he was there, his family, al Haritha, and others, they were looking for him because he was yani, taken by force. So his uncles and his father, looking for their son, their kin, they went from people to people, they tracked him down to Mecca. And they went to Mecca to take back their son, their kin, their brother, their nephew. And when they found the Prophet this is a beautiful hadith. Look at the manners of Rasulullah before Prophet. When they found the Prophet they told him, look, he was taken by force. We will pay you. We will pay for his freedom. The Prophet ﷺ told them, I don't want your money. He's free. It's up to him. I freed him already. When he comes, you guys ask him. Don't take him by force. Let him have the choice. If he wants to go with you, he can go with you. He's free to go. And if he wants to stay with me, he's free to stay with me as a free man. So they, Haritha, as Ibn Kathir and Al-Dahabi and other, they said, you know, Obviously, he's going to want to go back home. Who wants to live in servitude, right? Like, they didn't realize what a man, Rasulullah Muhammad والسلام, was, what his akhlaq, what his manners were like, what blessing it was to sit in his presence. And this is before Prophet. So when Zayd ibn al-Haratha came, he was very happy. He saw his father, his uncle, they were very happy that they were here. And he's such a good man. I mean, Muhammad والسلام, he's such a good man. He's freed you. Let's go home. He says, no. I want to stay with him. I want to stay with him. As a free man, I want to stay in his service. Something today we cannot comprehend. But these were the people. I mean, even after this time, Nafi', the Mawla of Abdullah ibn Umar, Hamran, the Mawla of Uthman ibn Affan, these were all free. Nafi' was taken as a captive in war. Abdullah ibn Umar freed him. He didn't go, woo I'm out. No, he stayed in the servitude of Abdullah ibn Umar willingly. Why? To learn knowledge from him. Amran, he stayed in the servitude of Uthman. Why? To learn from him. They, they, and he served them as slaves, even though they were not slaves. They were free. Why? They understood the importance of Suhbat al-Alim, yani the companion of a person of knowledge, and to take that knowledge. So Zayd ibn Haritha radiyanu here, he says, I want to stay. His father is shocked. Like, what do you mean? He says, you don't know what a person this is. What mannerisms he has. But Anas ibn Malik, later on. Anas ibn Malik is not in, in a Sahabi yet. Right? Anas ibn Malik, later his mother sent him in the servitude of, of Rasulullah SAW. Also not a slave. I mean, willingly he went to serve the Prophet SAW. Anas ibn Malik says that I served the Prophet SAW for years. And he never asked me, why did you do this or why didn't you do this? Imagine, even with our own children, we're not like this, right? We never tell nobody here. 
myself first and foremost, I, have, I can say I have never told my son, hey, or my daughter, why did you do this? Or why didn't you do this? I look at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's akhlaq. Anas ibn Malik, he said, I, I, Rasul Sallam sent me the task. I was supposed to do a task. I went out and I forgot. I started playing with the young men. Right? He says, after a long time, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, he tapped me. He didn't get mad. He didn't get upset. I told you, give it down. What are you doing? How could you forget? No. He said, look at, he said, he never even said oof to me. The lightest. And what a beautiful, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing from different ahadith together, but these are reliable, authentic narrations. Zayd ibn Haratha, radiallahu anhu, not only did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa free him and show him, but he got him married to Umm Ayman. And Umm Ayman, we talked about her earlier in the durus as well. And they had a son named Usama, Ibn Zayd. Usama ibn Zayd, subhanAllah, is now very young. He's, he's, he is now the son from Zayd ibn Haritha and Umm Ayman. Radiallahu anhu. And here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has such a dear love for them that he puts Zayd ibn Harith many times in charge above many of the other Sahaba who were higher than him in status. He even put Usama ibn Zayd as the Amir on an army that Abu Bakr and Umar and those types are what were in that army. Usama at the time is around 17 years of age. Bilal, like I said, he was, he's made the Amir many a times until he's even the Amir of Sham. People who were freed slaves. The, Bilal, what's his grandfather's name? Anyway, we don't know. Rabah, his father's name. What's his grandfather's? We don't know. Alim of Tariq, we don't know. The Arab, they were so strict about lineage. They didn't, but he's made the Amir. Why? Because Islam doesn't look at race. Islam doesn't look at which household you came from. Islam looks at your abilities. Zayd ibn Haratha, Osam ibn Zayd, their abilities. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa put them in charge, and the Sahaba didn't say, what? I'm Qurayshi, I'm from Banu Hashim, I'm from Banu whatever, right? But Umayya, how can I be led by a slave or a freed slave? No. If that's the Amr, the order of Rasulullah sallallahu we hear and obey. Zayd ibn Harata radiallahu anhu, he is also, and he will talk about Zaynab radiallahu anhu. And that marriage. Why? Because this is why he is the only Sahabi mentioned in the Quran by name. Right? Here, Zainab radiyanha, the family wants her married to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has such a, a tawadu, as humbleness. He encourages her to be married to Zayd ibn Harith. And in some of the orientalists and some of the people, they try to yeah, I mean, switch things up, right? They try to, oh, he wanted to marry his stepdaughter's, the stepson's wife. If he wanted to marry her, that's where the proposal came. He had seen her because they were from the, I mean, they were related before the orders of hijab and stuff. They had seen each other. If he wanted to marry her, he would have married her. But instead, he had her married to Zayd Rabiyan. And this was the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clear up one of the ahkam of Sharia. Now, Zayd Rabiyan, before the ruling of Sharia, what was he called after the time when he was freed and his family came and he did not go back with his family? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and again this is before prophethood, he took him in his household and he told the Quraysh, know that he is my son. So he was called Zayn ibn Muhammad. Now was he the son of Muhammad alayhi salatu salam? No. He's the son of Al-Harith. But the Arab, they had this tradition where they would adopt and they would give you their lineage. Which is a dhulam in a way, it's an oppression because in reality you're somebody else's son and your real father now loses their son and that lineage and that, so on. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought justice in the Qur'an. So to clarify this hukam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that Zainab radiallahu anha was married to Zayd radiallahu anha. But then after their divorce, because of their own issues, and this happened sometimes, two good people just doesn't mix, right? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered that Zainab radiallahu anha be married to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is the Amr of Allah, right? 
And this clarified to the world that just because you support somebody and just because you take them under your wing doesn't mean that they're your biological children. Your father has the right to be called your father. Right? And that is why Zayd anhu he went back to being called Zayd ibn al-Haratha radiallahu anhu. A lot to talk about, but I want to move forward in this. Uthman ibn Affan, from the early Muslims. And these are the foundations. These are the people that later you will see the great things like Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiyallahu that they will leave the ummah. You need to know what they went through. Uthman radiyallahu was one of the earliest of Muslims. Right? And we have a whole biography of him talking about his khilafah. We can look at details. I'm just going to mention some quick things. Nobody in the history of the world can be called Dhul Nurain in the sense that he was married to two of the daughters of Prophet ﷺ except Uthman And this was no accident as Rasulullah ﷺ himself said that Allah ordered me to marry my daughters. And when one died, because you cannot be married to two sisters at one time, one died, he could have said, okay, khalas, you have the blessing, you were married to one of the daughters of Prophet ﷺ, you have that relation, you are now a relative of the Prophet ﷺ through that link, khalas. He said, no, second one be married to. And then there are different narrations that mention different wording, but to the meaning that even if, if after her, Rasulullah some had more daughters, he would marry more to him. Why? Because of the great mannerisms of Uthman radiyanhu. Even before Islam, he never looked at the awr. He used to never look at the private. His own or others, even himself, when he, and this is from his own hayat and his own shyness, that when he would take a bath, he would keep a loin cloth, he would wash underneath, but he would cover it. And when he would go to his family, he would go in the dark or in a way that he, he just felt he had that great shyness. Not that it's haram. I mean, there is no aura between husband and wife. But this was from his own inner characteristics. Uthman who never drank alcohol even before Islam. Abu Bakr never drank alcohol. He said, how can, just from the evils of it, subhanAllah, today I was looking through the news feed. And I saw two articles, both from Fox, interestingly, Fox News. The first, and you can look these up, is a clear, they said, no doubt, scientifically, we have proven that alcohol causes cancer. Alcohol is by no doubt one of the causes of cancer. The second was the 10 worst foods for you. And all you keto guys, number one was not bread or rice. <laughs> number one, not sugar. Where's Father? Right? <laughs> What was number one? Bacon. Number one, according to Fox. And I just skimmed through the and I thought, SubhanAllah, look at the hikmah of Islam. Allah made those haram for us before we did any kind of clinical trials or any kind of testing or any kind of news articles or somebody in, in a lab. Allah made it haram because Allah is our creator. He knows better what's good for us. We, the Sahaba, the Tabi'un, they didn't know that alcohol causes cancer. They didn't know bacon and its effects on the human body. But they didn't drink, eat pork. They didn't drink alcohol. Why? Because Allah made it haram. They got the benefit. They got the reward and the benefit. Today people fast, intermediate fasting. They might get the health reward, right? The health benefits. Many people after reading that article, they'll stop drinking alcohol. They'll stop eating pork. But they won't get the ajr for it. Niyan. We as Muslims get the ajr and the health benefits. Uthman Radiyah never drank alcohol. He never made zina. He never listened to music. And when the Quraysh would have their music festival, he never went to them. Why? He saw it as, as disgusting, as lewd. Uthman Radiyah had such akhlaq. As in the uh, book, it's called Mosu' al-Tariq al-Islami. They said that the Quraysh and the Arab, and this is after Islam as well, and before, when they loved somebody, how they had a, they, they had a poem, the Arabs were very good at poems. One line from that poem, they would say, Uhibbaka wa rahman That I love you, wa rahman and in Qasam. We're taking Qasam with a rahman Hubb al Quraysh wa Uthman. He said, I love you, wa rahman Hubb al Quraysh wa Uthman. And he, I love you, I swear by Rahman. It's a few words, deep meaning. The love of the Quraysh for Uthman. Radiallahu. What does that mean? 
that the Quraysh, the people loved Uthman Radiyan so much that it became an example. Mithal, yani, exemplary. And this is a love not because of lust. Like today in the West, all our examples unfortunately are like Romeo and Juliet, and what's that? I don't know, some useless stuff, which is all lust based. How old was Juliet, by the way? <laughs> right? And when you talk about any of this love, it's never a, a love that actually turns into like a marriage. Every, every one of those stories, when you let La Majnu or whatever you want to go to write, it's always like they both die before getting married, right? Because you don't want to talk about the, the, the having kids and raising them and waking up and changing diapers and sickness. And you just want to talk about this romanticized you know, idea, which is the true love is what comes after marriage, if you're talking about husband and wife. But this love is not a love based on lust and desire. This is a love based on the akhlaq of Uthman Rabiyyan. He had such good manners that this love was such that he became an example in poems to come. I will mention just a few more things that will end for today, even though I had a lot of other things to cover. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the hadith that is mentioned, and I originally found in the book called Sharh Rasul al atiqad but I looked at the takhreej, I went and checked until I found it in Tabari and at Tabrani. Those are two different scholars, Tabari and Tabrani. Both of them with Sahih, authentic chains. He mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dakhala ala ibnatihi Ruqayya. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa entered the house of his daughter Ruqayya, Ruqayya radiallahu anha. And she was Taghsilu Ra'sul Uthman radiallahu anha. She was washing the head of Uthman radiallahu anha. And he was covered obviously. She was just washing his hair. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh my daughter, Ahsani, yani be very best in your mannerism ila Abi, Abdil, uh, Abi Abdillah. Be the best in your mannerism towards Abu Abdullah. In the Arabic, when you put ila, then you make it abi and abdillah because mudaf mudaf ilay. Because some of you are going to say, oh, he messed up. He said Abu Abdullah, and then he said, ah, go get happy. Ila <laughs> abi abdillah. He's not, no, imagine, I, I just want to, I mean, these are such beautiful things. I feel like talking an hour about it, but you guys are going to get tired. Right? Rasulullah, some, such a great father in law. He didn't go and go, oh, look how he's treating my daughter. He's making her wash his hair. Can he wash his own hair? No. Instead, he encourages her more. He tells her, be the best towards your husband. Towards Abu Abdullah, yani Uthman ibn Affan radiyallahu. فَإِنَّهُ أَشْبَهُ أَصْحَابِ bi خُلْقًا Because verily, he is the closest of my companions to me in akhlaq, in his mannerism. Sahih hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, the closest to the akhlaq, to the manner, the good moral character of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa from his companions is Uthman ibn Affan radiyan. And we all know the hadith where Aisha radiyan, Sahih hadith, again, if you're going to accept a hadith in al-Bukhari, then you have to accept them. Right? Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when he was sitting and Abu Bakr Radiyan came and he had a part of his leg showing and he didn't fix it. And when Amr Radiyan came, he didn't. When Uthman Radiyan came, he got up and fixed it. Aisha Radiyan, now Abu Bakr is her father. Radiyallahu anhu. She asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how come? My father came, he didn't move. Amr came, you didn't move. Amr, and he has his big status. Uthman Radiyan came, you got up, you fixed your, your, your izar. He said, should I not be shy of the one the Malaika had hayat? The malaika, yani the angels have, not, not high, shy like, oh, they're scared, no. But like, you know, when somebody of knowledge, if somebody of honor comes, like you're not going to use bad words. I mean, this is our bad akhlaq nowadays, that sometimes we do, but yani you, you kind of fix yourself up. Right? You're shy from acting foolish around them. I remember when my father was alive, may Allah have mercy on him. You know, sometimes when I was young, I was yani, 14, 15, you would be joking with your friends and things. And my father would come, I would like sit up straight, and my friend would be like, what's wrong with you, right? They're non muslims at the time. I'd be like, no, that's my dad, you know. <laughs> he comes here and says, you need anything, dad? <laughs> right? So the malaika have that haya from Uthman radiyallahu. And this is, uh, again, Sahih, and you can find it in the Sahih of Muslim, for example, another kutub with the fadal of Uthman radiyallahu. 
I will end here today, inshallah, and we'll continue back up in the early parts of the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and how the uh, da'wah became open and, and the hardships and things that came, which is Akumullahu Khalifa.